Hi, and welcome to the Ocean Expert Exchange, a webinar series produced by the UF Thompson Earth Systems Scientist in Every Florida School Program and the Anjari Foundation. Every two weeks, a marine scientist will present their area of expertise, followed by a question and answer session. The Scientist in Every Florida School Program is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. The CEPS program connects and builds long-term relationships between teachers and scientists in order to bring current scientific research and big data into the classrooms in Florida and beyond. And Jerry Foundation is a nonprofit headquartered in West Palm Beach, Florida. The foundation supports and promotes marine science research and education. And many of the foundation's primary initiatives involve its 65-foot research vessel, the RV Jerry, which completed its 34th mission earlier this school year. Anjari also uses innovative technology, film, and other media to raise awareness and strengthen science education and is pleased to be partner with scientists and resources to bring students, teachers, and the public during this exceptional time. Today, we are joined by Dr. Krista Sherman. She is a marine scientist with more than a decade of research and conservation experience and is also the first Bahamian female with a PhD in the marine sciences. She recently completed a self-funded PhD in biological sciences at the University of Exeter, graduating in July of 2018. And she also holds an uh, MRAS in ocean science from the University of Southampton. She, her PhD research assessed the status, population structures, and dynamics of NASA grouper spawning aggregations and was critical to the development of the first NASA grouper conservation management plan for the Bahamas. At this time, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Sherman. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And thanks to all of you for joining today. Um, I heard we have a lot of students on board. So as Stephanie mentioned, I work for the Perry Institute for Marine Science and we're a small nonprofit research organization. Uh, our work really aims to support healthy, biodiverse and resilient marine ecosystems and to provide science-based recommendations for sustainability. And actually a huge focus of my work is on fisheries, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. So why fisheries? Why do we care? Well, fisheries provide many benefits, um, both direct benefits here and indirect to us, in addition to the traditional ecological benefits that people uh, talk about, such as biodiversity and ecosystem function. Unfortunately, 30% of fisheries have been overexploited and that represents significant losses to biodiversity, ecosystem services, and these social and economic benefits. So improving our understanding of fisheries then is really critical in order for, a, for us to be able to effectively manage these resources and conserve them. And that's really important for us here in the Bahamas we are an archipelago or a chain of islands, 700 over 2000 keys in a small island developing state and a coastal nation. So as you can imagine, managing fisheries across that entire seascape uh, sometimes can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, for the Bahamas, most of the fishing actually occurs on the banks that you see here. So the Great Bahama Bank and Little Bahama Bank, uh, but fishing actually occurs throughout the archipelago. Uh, the main types of fisheries in the Bahamas or the fishery sectors include commercial fishing, subsistence, some people refer to it as artisanal fishing, as well as recreational and sports fishing. And the, some of the key fishery species in the Bahamas uh, include spiny lobster, NASA grouper, uh, queen conch, uh, and bonefish. And although tourism is extremely important to us, it's our number one industry, uh, the fisheries sector is also hugely important to our economy, generating up to 2% of our GDP. So really important in terms of providing jobs, as you can see here, just through the commercial fisheries sector alone, but also up to 10% of our protein. Of the species that I mentioned, spiny lobster is most important for the commercial fishery, which is for profit. And approximately 90% of spiny lobster is actually exported from the Bahamas and that generates between 60 to $70 million per year. Uh, queen conch is a staple uh, for the Bahamian diet and that dates back all the way to the original inhabitants of the Bahamas, the Lucayan or Arawak Indians. And that pressure is that, that, that history of eating conch has continued today. Unfortunately, conch populations here in the Bahamas uh, in the Florida Keys and in parts of the Caribbean aren't doing so well and that's because of that fishing pressure. 
Uh, as a result, Queen Kong is listed on the Convention on International Trade for Endangered Species or CITES under Appendix 2 of that list. And what that means is that list considers species that are at risk so that their trade is regulated to ensure that they survive. Uh, so most of the conch is consumed in the Bahamas, although we do have some exports. Nassau grouper, um, on the other hand, has been overfished throughout its range, but it's an important, one of the most important fish predators to uh, coral reefs in particular, responsible for helping to maintain reef health. Um, but because of this heavy fishing pressure, it's listed as critically endangered. Bonefish, on the other hand, is primarily a catch and release species here in the Bahamas, and it's hugely valuable to the recreational fisheries sector. So what you may have noticed uh, with just these few examples of some of the key fisheries species so far is that all of them are in decline. And just like in other parts of the world, here in the Bahamas, our fisheries face a number of threats, overfishing as we've already talked about today, uh, but climate change, illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, uh, habitat loss and declining quality of habitat, and that can be due to coastal development, invasive species, as well as natural disasters and disturbances. So here in the Bahamas, we have to deal with hurricanes and we had a really bad one recently. So how do you manage these fisheries then? Well, from an ecological perspective, there are several important considerations, uh, things like life history, habitat use and connectivity. So thinking about it, how long does it take for a species to develop from the larval stage, as you see here, through to an adult where it's actually breeding and contributing to the fishery. What habitat or habitats are needed throughout that process and how are populations connected uh, over space and in time. So then fisheries managers have a suite of options that are available to use that should be based on this science um, in consultation with those uh, that are involved in the fisheries sector. So for the Bahamas, we have gear restrictions and some of the, the restrictions that apply to all species include uh, a ban on the use of scuba gear for fishing, uh, spare guns aren't allowed, and longline fishing is also prohibited. Uh, we also have quotas or allowable catches for certain species, size limits, closed season bans as well. So the Bahamas is a shark sanctuary, turtles are also protected. Uh, and we have a number of marine protected areas in the country. The actual management of these fisheries is a legal responsibility for, uh, falls under the Department of Marine Resources. And they actually have assistance from several government agencies that you see here, uh, including the Defense Force and the police. Uh, but they're also assisted by park wardens who help to manage marine protected areas and enforce fisheries regulations. And the Bahamian government actually mandates that commercial fishing, that right is reserved for Bahamian nationals only, so fishing for profit. And the fisheries regulations that are outlined in our Fisheries Act are really designed to help manage and conserve all of the fisheries resources that are found within our country's exclusive economic zone. Uh, so for those of you that are interested, you can actually download the Fisheries Act online and have a look at all of the regulations. The Department of Marine Resources also has information on its website with, with regards to permitting and licensing. Uh, and fairly recently, we conducted a review to look at fisheries regulations across species and provide a summary of that information and looked at what's worked and what hasn't worked so well. And in terms of studying fisheries, there are generally two types of methods broadly that are used, and those include fishery dependent methods. So for example, uh, the Department of Marine Resources captures all of the data from the commercial fishery sector, and you can look at trends over time to see how the fishery is doing and the fish stocks. And there are also fisheries independent methods, uh, relying on study, studying populations of fishery species of interest naturally. So what I wanna to do today is share some case studies with you based on these fisheries independent methods that are also used to help support the data that's gathered from the commercial fisheries sector. So the first is queen conch, and we already talked about the cultural uh, importance of the species and the economic importance as well. The regulation that we have in the Bahamas simply states that conch have to have a well-formed flared lip the Department of Marine Resources also 
uh, sets an export quota in conjunction with the, co the countries that are involved in the trade and the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Management Mechanism. As you can see here from this image though, there are still some conch that are being harvested that don't have this well-formed flared lip. Um, and so what, what's happening is a lot of the landings of conch in the Bahamas are falling within this IUU category. So what some of the research that's been done, uh, particularly by Alan Stoner and the colleagues at Community Conch, uh, has looked at the age and reproduction of conch and the densities required in order for them to, uh, to reproduce. So some of their research has shown that conch, in order for them to breed, their reproduction is density dependent. So they are a snail, slow moving, um, and there needs to be a minimum number of conch within a certain area in order for them to actually successfully find each other and breed. And that happens to be between 50 and 75 adult conch per hectare. Uh, and so for you, those of you that are wondering, a hectare is about the size of a rugby pitch or a football pitch because it's not something uh, that you're probably used to hearing. The research also showed that conch are sexually mature around the age of six and that corresponds to a shell lip thickness of about 15 millimeters. Uh, their research also showed that conch populations in the Exuma Keys Island and Sea Park, which is a no-take uh, marine protected area, are, are getting older and there's not a lot of recruitment or new conch coming in and settling into that park. Uh, so what some of the recommendations then for conch in order to maintain healthy densities uh, is to include this aspect in terms of when conch are actually sexually mature within the regulations but also uh, setting a minimum densities of at least 100 adult individuals per hectare. So moving on to our second case study, this is Nassau grouper. And we already talked about this as being uh, an ecologically important species, uh, but there's something really unique about Nassau grouper and that is the way it breeds. So this species forms annual uh, fish spawning aggregations to reproduce or to breed. And within the Bahamas, we have two specific regulations that are designed to help with managing and protecting NASA grouper. The first is a closed season, which coincides with part of the breeding period for the species. And during that time, no NASA grouper is supposed to be landed, processed, or sold in the country. And any other grouper species that's landed is supposed to be landed with the head, uh, tail, and skin intact so that you can verify that it's not NASA grouper. And there's also a minimum uh, size limit of three pounds or bigger. What we have learned um, over the last few years doing some work, this is based on some acoustic telemetry. And I know you've heard a little bit about this already in the series of talks uh, with the shark migrations talk earlier. Uh, using acoustic telemetry is a way you can study fish movement patterns. And so this work was actually led by Craig Dahlgren. And what he found is that fish are migrating from the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park all the way down to Long Island. Um, so these fish are traveling really long distances. So essentially what you do for those of you that did miss that talk, this is a transmitter here, you surgically implant that into a fish and then these are receivers that are placed on the seafloor. And once the fish swims within detection range of it, that information gets picked up and recorded. So you're able to tell uh, when and where fish are moving, able to calculate distances. So it's really valuable. And in this case, we realize that fish are migrating from the shelf edge to the reefs and migrating in groups during the winter full moons to these spawning sites to breed, covering some really, really long distances. Um, so that's really interesting because outside of marine protected areas, they are not protected. And actually one of the biggest threats for NASA grouper is the fact that a lot of them are illegally caught during the period when they are breeding. So during uh, the, the closed season, up to 40% of individuals. What some of this research has also shown because we collect, while we're tagging these fish, length and weight information, our minimum size limit for grouper is three pounds, which is what you see here in the straight line. 
The actual average size of which fish first migrate to spawn are 54 centimeters or bigger. Okay, 77% of individuals were 54%, uh, uh, 54 centimeters or bigger. So what that means is the current regulation is legally allowing for, for us to harvest fish before they've actually had a chance to spawn and contribute to the fisheries. Uh, some of the other research that we've done has also shown that outside of marine protected areas like the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, uh, fish populations of Nassau grouper and the biomass, so the size of those individuals, are really greatly reduced. So from a management perspective then, there are justifications to make some changes to our regulations to provide better protection for Nassau grouper, uh, including considering and in, uh, increasing our size limit, uh, improving the design of our marine protected areas as well. <clears throat> So based on these case studies and some other fisheries resources that we have managed, uh, we see that we have some opportunities to make some changes, uh, particularly across all of these species, tackling uh, enforcement is an issue as well as addressing the IUU fishing, so that illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. We also need the capacity to be able to consistently conduct research and monitor to know how we're doing in terms of these management interventions, and then to consistently educate and raise awareness with, for people with regards to these regulations, why they're important to increase compliance. Uh, there's a real opportunity for us to be able to apply this science to improving these fisheries regulations for the species to helping with sustainable development and how islands should be developed, uh, to help with reducing threats to the habitat that these species need through helping to design recovery efforts, uh, as well as marine protected areas. Some of the research um, has shown adult movement patterns and connectivity, and we know that's an important aspect. But if you remember back to that life history slide a few uh, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, larvae are an important aspect of that too because we need to ensure that populations are maintained. So connectivity is an important aspect of marine protected area design. So for the Bahamas overall, I would say that we've made considerable progress with regards to how fisheries are managed, um, but there are opportunities for us to integrate science to strengthen our capacity to manage fisheries and that would mean we have the potential to increase uh, both food and economic security for the country. Uh, so really the future of our fisheries is dependent on how quickly we're able to adapt and implement these strategies and to deal with the current threats and any future threats um, that may emerge. Um, so with that, I think we have a lot of questions and I will stop and thank you all for listening today. I know uh, school semester is basically wrapped up for a lot of students and I would encourage you to visit our website and follow us on social media um, if you're interested in more of our programs and our projects. So thank you and I'll turn it back over to Brian and Stephanie. Hey Dr. Sherman, thank you so much for that presentation. Our first question for today is going to come from Julie who asks, how often do fish leave the Bahamas and is that something you're able to see? So for NASA grouper, for example, the, the tracking uh, information that we have do not indicate that fish are actually leaving the Bahamas. There are highly migratory species like sharks, tuna, for example, that are transboundary. And so managing those species then uh, would require us to be in communication with other countries. Our next question comes from Jeremy who asks, are conch also over harvested in Florida? Yes, so conch populations in the Florida Keys um, have been over harvested and actually a lot of the conch that we export from the Bahamas uh, ends up in Florida. Meredith asks, can you please explain more about a marine protected area and what it is and how you create one? Right, uh, so a marine protected area is an area that has been um, set aside. Um, sometimes it's set aside to protect specific species. Sometimes it's set aside to protect a range of habitats that are important like coral reefs, mangroves, or seagrasses. And so some of the things that you want to consider are what species are there, 
uh, what the population is, how are they structured, how are they connected in order to maintain them, but you also need to factor into any uh, stakeholders um, that are around and using that area to get their input in terms of how that, that uh, protected area should be managed and how it should be zoned for certain uses, whether you allow um, recreational activities, whether recreation, recreational activities are banned in certain areas, whether you can fish, whether you can fish if it's a no-take area. So there are a range of um, options that are available, but it's basically designed to, to protect uh, species and habitats. Our next question comes from Cameron, who asks, regarding the Nassau grouper, the graph shows that it is legal to harvest individuals before they have the chance to reproduce. How was the size of individuals regarding that law chosen? What needs to happen to change these laws? Yes. So what happened with Nassau grouper, the size, the minimum size limit that we current, currently have was based on age at first sexual uh, maturity, and that was averaged throughout the Caribbean. So it's based on a fish that was about three pounds or four years at the beginning stages of when Nassau grouper actually sexually mature. And at that time, uh, those fish are about between 44 to 48 centimeters. Um, within the Bahamas, there wasn't work that was done back then with regards to uh, acoustic telemetry, looking at when fish were moving and at what size they were moving. So that information was available. Now that we have that information, it's important that we uh, upgrade our regulations to account for what's actually happening. So although fish may reach sexual maturity as early as four years, fish in the Bahamas are not actually migrating to spawn until they're at least seven years of age. So they are a lot bigger than that um, current size limit. Victoria asks, is aquaculture farming a possibility to address the protein needs instead of fishing? That is a really good question. Um, and there have been uh, several companies and organizations that have explored aquaculture as an option. Um, the challenge is they have not really been successful um, in terms of being able to make a profit. There are also some other challenges with aquaculture um, as well in terms of keeping uh, the organisms that you're growing alive through to the size where you can actually sell them and make a profit. And it's really costly initially and requires a lot of technical expertise in order to, to keep those fish alive, to keep their food alive, to reduce the costs associated with the amount you need to feed them and to optimize their growth. But, you know, that may be an option for some species in the future, but it hasn't worked just yet here in the Bahamas. Sejal says, can you please explain a bit about the lip thickness on the conch and its relationship with the gonad development? Um, so basically what they did, they looked at stages of development in the conch um, and what they found uh, corresponding to when conch were most uh, ripe, the, the testes and the eggs and sperm, that happened to be when the shell was about 15 millimeters um, thick. So there's a correlation there in terms of the thickness of the lip of the shell, as well as the stages of of development of the, go the gonads. Lara asks, how much of what you have learned in the Bahamas can be applied to Florida or the US in general? That's a good question. Um, a lot of what we have seen in the Bahamas, there, there are links so that the threats that we're experiencing are the same threats that other fisheries managers and scientists see in other parts of the world. Um, and there are opportunities for us to collaborate, especially for species, for example, that um, may be uh, highly migratory in terms of how we manage them. Um, we can also learn from what's worked and what's not worked well in other countries and, and try and go from there. Um, so there, there are some, some options that are available. Our next question comes from Mallory who asks, how would it look like concretely to integrate the research and science into the management of fisheries in the Bahamas? So logistically, what are your ways as scientists to work alongside uh, fishery management? Yeah, so we work directly with the Department of Marine Resources. And one of the things that we can do to translate the science into something that's more usable is to help develop fisheries management plans. So that's something 
um, that we have done for NASA Grouper. We can also work on developing policy briefs. Uh, something that we do as well is develop report cards uh, to report on the condition of uh, reefs, for example, and how they're doing with recommendations and for managers to help improve um, how those habitats and those resources are doing. Um, it is not easy, but it can be done. Um, but communicating that information in a way that's accessible to them is, is a really important first step. Okay, we have time for just a few more questions. Our next one comes from Annabelle who asks, what's the most important fishery in your mind? <laughs> um, that's really hard. <laughs> um, they're all important for different reasons because there are different types of fisheries and, and fishery sectors. Um, I do have my biases, but they're, they're all important either because of the value that they provide to us in terms of money or what they provide in terms of helping um, the environment. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to not name a species. Our next question for you is how and why do fish migrate in the first place? Yeah, that's a really good question. So fish migrate for a number of reasons. Sometimes it's to find a mate like Nasser Grouper. Sometimes it's to find food. Uh, sometimes it's because they need to change habitat. Uh, so there, there are lots of different reasons uh, why um, fish migrate. Really good question. And our final question today comes from Valerie who asks, what is the timeline with recommendation made and changes in the law and finally reinforcement of the new law? For example, if you want to change the minimum size of the Nassau grouper. Yeah. So that's something I can say that we've been working on for two years already. Um, I'm not sure how much longer it's going to take for us to get to the point where um, the change in the law happens, um, but it's a systematic process. Uh, so the research has been done, recommendations have been submitted, it has to go before councils and the government has to review it and consider it. So it, it, it can be a long process and then obviously right now um, with everything that's going on, that's not a huge priority, but hopefully we can get that going again once things uh, come back to normal. Um, but it is important that we try and accelerate that process a little bit because for some species, time is critical. Well, Dr. Sherman, thank you so much. Are there any final thoughts you would like to leave our attendees with today? No, but I would like to thank all of you for joining today. I know school was actually out for some of you, so I really appreciate you being here and the opportunity to share what we do at PIMS. With that being said, I'm gonna hand things over to Stephanie for her final thoughts and to wrap things up. Thanks, Brian. We wanna thank everyone for joining us today on the call. A special thanks to Dr. Sherman to talk with us about Bahamas and Bahamian fisheries. And um, you can join us for our next program, which will be in two weeks for the Ocean Expert Exchange in case you need something to do this summer. Uh, again, this is a collaboration between the Scientists in Every Florida School program and the Anjuri Foundation. We're very excited to bring scientists like Dr. Sherman to you on a regular basis. Uh, for more information, you can follow us on our websites, Scientists in Every Florida School and the Anjari Foundation. Um, again, you can register for our future event, June 15th. We'll have our next edition of Ocean Expert Exchange. Uh, you can also find information for Dr. Sherman on your screen now. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a fabulous day. Bye-bye.